You know what? Um, I, we have a lot of really good discussion that is just waiting to happen. So even though I'm sure a couple more folks will drift in, let's get going with um, our topic, which is uh, increasing collaboration in uh, civic tech research by acknowledging the uh, potential for there to exist a divide in, in research across research tradition. Um, the inspiration for this conversation, oh, sorry. The inspiration for this conversation um, really has, uh, has crept up on me uh, as a result of being somebody who trained in an academic tradition, who has uh, explored doing impact research in terms of evaluating the effects that a civic tech project has on the world, um, and working, if not directly with, at least close to design researchers who were doing work that I observed was really useful, really interesting, and in some ways overlapped with the methods that I had been taught uh, when doing qualitative research. So, you know, the idea that we have a lot of research that's happening in parallel and possibly not in conversation um, with uh, each other is something that I thought would be nice to kind of explore. Um, and so I brought together a group of people who uh, have a lot of thoughts on this and who come from a variety of research traditions. Um, and I thought that that might be true of this group as well, that we would have um, you know, at your tables, an opportunity to uh, explore how your approach to research aligns with or is dissimilar from other folks who share an interest in the same topics as you. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down the line and ask people to uh, introduce themselves, um, to also introduce uh, themselves as researchers, so to say what kind of research, um, actually let me take that back. So you have three questions. Who are you? What is research? Because that's an important part of this, right? And what kind of research do you do? Did you shout out? OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, one at a time. It's built in. OK. So my name is Christopher Wilson. Uh, I don't really know what research is. It's a, that's a hot mess. Um, but I like to think that I have an idea about what research should be, and I think it has to do with answering uh, specific questions that we will use the answers for and doing it in some kind of methodical way so that we can trust the answers we get. Um, I am a, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a civil society refugee in, in academia. Uh, my background is in the UN where I did a lot of, uh, you know, uh, impact assessment uh, style uh, research. Then I worked for an engine, uh, organization called the Engine Room for a number of years where we did a lot of practical and applied research. Um, lots of it ordered uh, uh, by, by donors who wanted to know how their work was playing out. And then I uh, started a PhD, and now I'm in the academy. Uh, and, and I struggle. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to exploit the academy and all the expertise there is there for everything it's worth for practical application. Because right now there is, you know, as we all know, there's this dramatic divide between traditions. There's a whole host of academic disciplines doing uh, serious research on, on the stuff that we do, the types of things that we do, and it's fragmented accord, according to the research object, you know, whether it studies e-participation or open government or voting or, or civic engagement, and it's fragmented by discipline, um, whether it's, you know, political scientists or communication scholars or anthropologists. And then it's, again, fragmented by methodologies. There's people doing quant, people doing and qual and everything in between. Um, and none of those disciplines are talking to each other. And we're not talking to any of them, except for Tic Tech, where we get one or two every year. Um, and, and so figuring out how to make the most of that. Because at the end of the day, the methods that get applied are important. They are how we know that we're not just finding the answers we're trying to find. It's how we know that we can trust the results of our research. But they've also become incredibly onerous and laborious. They make everything difficult. And all these things that happen in the academy that gives the academy a bad name, uh, you know, things like IRBs and peer review and so slow publication processes, these are safeguards that have ossified over time. They were put in place for a reason. I, I like to say it's very similar to you know, the rules in large institutional procurement processes. You know, we do it for a reason to avoid corruption, but then it becomes this terrible thing that everybody wants to avoid. So what I want to figure out is how to extract all the good stuff. How can we learn from that? How can we learn to apply methods in practical, applied, quick research that will give us meaningful results without getting sucked into all the, 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 the quagmire that is the academy? 
Uh, I don't know if that you answers. Yourself. So if oh, you had to choose a word, what, what, or two words, and the reason that we're going to choose a word or two words will also be an object for you, so you may think about this too. Uh, interloper, methodological fundamentalist. Methodological <laughs> fundamentalist, okay, good. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is uh, Chechi Sum, or just call me Mike. That will make your life easier. Um, I'm from the OECD. More precisely, I work for PISA, the Program for International Student Assessment. Um, so one word why how I was define myself as a researcher, I would say I'm a free rider of uh, all the wonderful work or the academia is doing. Um, and also like an active consumer of knowledge and passive contributor, I will, I will define it that way. Um, this is quite interesting because I'll put a little disclaimer. I'm not in academia. Um, I have two masters, but I don't have a PhD. Um, so I'm not trained as, a, as a <laughs> academia in research. But, um, but, but why am I here is that um, we have done, uh, at OECD, we have done a very interesting, two interesting projects uh, last year. The first is we call pizza based for schools that we, uh, uh, we give um, individual school a tool an assessment that they can compare the performance with other countries, which is pretty new in the sense that it is first time schools have their own international data which they can do comparison for school improvement. The second thing that we did last year was called uh, PISA for You, that it is an online um, collaborative platform that uh, we group teachers and educators from all around the world together. They work with each other, they come up with a common challenge a common solution and implement the solution and evaluate it. So it is quite uh, innovative in that sense that we give the voice and data for individual teachers. And so why I am here is that, again, I'm free writing uh, all the conversation here, uh, is that I want to know um, how, well, how to define so-called success for this kind of civic technology. Uh, what is success like? And how can we conduct research to measure such success? And what kind of mechanism or that we can use to, to scale up to the impact of such kind of, um, of project? And so, yeah, so this is um, what I want to share now. I'm looking forward to discussion with you guys. If you had, if you had one to three words to describe yeah. yourself uh, as in on a hat, what would they be? Free rider? Free rider, yeah. good. Good morning, folks. I'm Martin Wright. I work for My Society. Um, my job title is des designer, and that probably gives you the clue that I'm not actually a researcher. Actually, my imposter syndrome is, is um, inflamed at the moment. Um, uh, my, ro my role is very broad. I do everything from branding, like this stuff, uh, all the way to talking to users, um, understanding how they use our online tools, and talking to like our own staff finding out uh, you know the issues they have so um research for me um is not a thing i am um it's kind of a, it's more like a tool so um i'd liken it to a magnifying glass or like a periscope something if i don't understand something like research is the thing i use to understand it better um it might be early on so it might be a problem i don't quite understand a problem so i'll use research to help define the problem better and later on in the process, it might be um, we might have a solution. So I'm, I might use research to um, judge the success of a solution. Um, so my one word would be designer, I guess. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Anna Coulomb. I'm a first year PhD student at the Open University. Um, but before that, I've been working for around eight years in uh, applied research in um, the charity sector. Uh, specifically for most of these years at BBC Media Action, which uses communication and technologies um, for development. So I've come from working in the applied research world, with, as, which, as you know, has a quite fast pace and a specific set of structures and ways of working. And now I'm into academia. And in academia, um, I'm working across four different disciplines. So I'm technically registered in the po politics department but I have a team of three supervisors that are from three different disciplines, sociology, psychology, and development. So I'm saying this because it shows, I think, the importance and the importance I place myself in um, not working in one silo or compartment, but actually across. So I would myself perhaps also define uh, as a free rider or perhaps like a chameleon where you, know, you try and apply basic principles um, in different contexts. 
and talking about different or basic principles, I would define research, I guess, as a systematic inquiry that is replicable, replicable in the sense that the process has to be transparent. Um, and I think as long as you are transparent about your position, the methodology, and the rationale for what you've done and why, then you can have academia questioning it or improving it with more rigor, or you can have um, different traditions um, applying its strengths, I guess. Um, so I guess we'll talk more about that later. But yeah, that's what it is for me on the basic level. <laughs> Hannah, your one to three word question, uh, the, the question about one to three words. So I guess, OK, I'll use the word chameleon. I don't know if it's the same as free rider, but we can discuss later. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Nicole Anand. I'm the Director of Strategy and Learning at the Engine Room. Um, so I'll go with that first one, what is research? Uh, for me, I think at the broadest level, research is essentially just information collection, synthesis, and analysis. But to what Christopher was saying about um, good research, I guess there's kind of two elements that I would talk about. One is um, is is around this idea of methodology that everybody has touched upon, and I think it's worth just kind of unpacking what is methodology, what defines methodology. And for me, that it, really the, the main thing is about intentionality and talking about what your intentions are so that you're intentional about your objectives, you're intentional about the people that you're um, asking questions, uh, or interviewing, et cetera. Um, so it's really just that that component is what makes up a methodology. Um, the other part that I think is worth talking about is um, something that I'm, we've also kind of touched upon, which is, OK, so you, so you collect and you synthesize and you analyze, but then for what? And so I think with good research, there is this component. You can call it what you want, but I, I would maybe call it engagement. Um, not so much an afterthought sort of communication strategy or dissemination strategy, but even kind of throughout. So when, how, how are you engaging your respondents in your interviews um, from, from start to finish? So that's. For me, those are kind of the important elements of, of research. Um, in terms of what type of researcher I am, uh, I think 10 years ago, well, so let me start with current. Uh, I, I guess, I suppose some people would call me a design researcher now since I teach design research at Parsons in New York. But uh, I think 10 years ago, m I might have said I do academic research. Eight years ago in India, we called it action research at the civil society organization that I was part of, action research or participatory research. Um, so I'm not sure, but I do know that my role at the engine room right now, um, we, we at the engine room, we, we house a lot of different types of researchers. So we have user researchers, we have user experience researchers, we have design researchers, we have um, what we call practic practitioner research, which is the core of it is like really focusing on digestible, um, uh, accessible information. Uh, so for me, my role is to kind of look at all of those methods find the complementarities between them and bring them together. Um, so I guess my word would be mixed methods researcher, maybe hyphenated. That's two words, right? Thank you. That was a lot of uh, wonderful scene setting here because the intention is to explore uh, you know, our relationships to the concept of research and uh, you know, how we kind of connect to that as an identity because each of these you know, processes of learning is also an acculturation, a socialization process. So for that reason, and the reason I kept narrowing people down to the one to three words is because uh, now is the craft section of the workshop um, where I'm going to see if people would be willing to take their one to three words and put them on a hat. So my words are going to be academic. <laughs> and uh, evaluation. Uh, it is entirely up to you whether to assign meaning to that. Um, the, <laughs> the way that you put them on, if you are open to that, if you do not want to wear a hat, uh, you do not need to wear a hat, 
You can also uh, choose to label yourself uh, with a uh, sticky note. Also, if you are at a small table, you, you do not need to do this at the moment. You can also do this as a discursive practice in a little while. This is an experiment in um, uh, you know, how the hats affect our conversation to some degree, too. But to put them on, what you can do is take the two ends, turn one around. What we're going to be doing is kind of slotting them in by cutting, by kind of ripping halfway. If you turn it back, you can slot them together. I am not a designer, but this is my first experience with an effort at, uh, at uh, group paper craft design. So if you don't have any at your table, there should be a couple up here at this front table if you are interested in participating. How do you define yourself uh, as a researcher, or what kind of research do you do? <laughs> Does, is this working? Is this like giving people an impression? Okay, good. All right. Feels so official. You know? So we just have a couple more minutes in this in the panel section before we, we send it back to you. Um, I feel like we got a little bit of a flavor of uh, what methods people were using. Is that right? Do you feel like we kind of fleshed that one out a little bit? I don't know. I don't feel like we've named a single method yet. Well, didn't we talk? No, we didn't. So, you know, with our remaining minutes, uh, we have the option, I think, of, well, let's, let's do a quick rundown of your favorite method to use. Uh, the method that you use most often when you're conducting research. And this should be quick so that we can get to the, the next question about principles. Um, so what is, what is your favorite method described briefly? Uh, um, I, I like uh, descriptive statistics and uh, participant observation and process tracing. I would say basically the same, because uh, we have the platform, uh, and then this is basically the type of um, information that we can connect from the behavior of the users, and uh, so I would say descriptive statistics, and that would be my answer. My favorite type of research is probably my, used, my least used, is uh, talking to people directly, uh, user interviews, um, either by the phone, um, in person, just I find getting it gives you way more context, and in, in my role, context always helps more than you know numbers and, and the kind of more statistical stuff. I always prefer mixed methods as well, but if I have to choose, uh, I would probably choose um, qualitative ethnography. So also talking to people directly, user interviews, and my hat is not. It's hard for me to answer this question without laughing because uh, we all look a little silly right now, but um, I, yes, I prefer mixed methods as well. Um, but I really enjoy ethnographic observation. Um, and more recently, since I've been dabbling a bit in, in uh, evaluation methods, um, I've also enjoyed uh, learning about contribution analysis. Mm. My own, uh, I didn't name mine. I, I do interviews most often lately, even though I'm surrounded by, by data folk. Um, the next question that I want to kind of ping pong a little bit is thinking about how do we uh, cement some principles or how do we start talking about principles that we might share across um, you know, these different methods and approaches. Um, we'll start with, I think, rigor. So if you wanted to think about how you define rigor or ensure that what you are doing is a rigorous form of research. I thought uh, Anna's description of the uh, you know, fundaments of research as being kind of a transparent and consistent process that you can um, show was, was really kind of pointing to this. Um, how do you think about ensuring that the work that you do meets a standard of rigor? Also briefly. Um, and do we mean, uh, is that the me personally or the oh. you generally? Uh, you personally. Oof, okay. 
So it's hard, right? Uh, because often uh, when you start asking the research questions that are the most interesting, uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time uh, looking at methods to discover that the most appropriate method to answer it isn't one you know how to do. And so, you know, uh, in, in, in you know, an academic setting as well, you often kind of have to bootstrap a little bit and learn things on the fly. And sometimes that stuff, like I just did an analysis where I was doing like moderate statistical moderation and mediation analyses uh, using different types of regressions that you know I barely understood and that was fun and challenging but then trying to figure out how to assess the validity um, you know and, and the 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 uh, software programs will pump out some numbers for you which tell you something about how to interpret that is really hard and so I think that what I ended up doing which is what most people probably end up doing is you call in favors and you make a few blind phone calls and you try to ask somebody who knows this a hundred times better than you do um, and I think that that's something we all have to do because at the end of the day, we're all strapped for time and resources. Uh, the danger is rather that we don't bother and we make assumptions that, you know, it feels okay to me. So it's probably not biased. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's, I, I won't take more time because I don't really have an answer. Well, I think like my side would just be like um, trapped in two different universes because when one point of PISA really, really very rigorous and especially with the representativeness of the sample. So that is very important for us. And the other hand, that with PISA for you on the platform that we've, we only have the teachers to use this on the platform. So it may not be possible for us to do the same record that we did in PISA. While uh, for, for the platform, it is more like an evaluation of the users. Uh, so it's more like user-focused research instead of what, um, um, so it's more what we can get out of it instead of we have a hypothesis and we test it. So I think uh, we are in two different uh, universes. Uh, for me, rigor um, is probably the reason why I wouldn't call what a lot of what we do research, um, because um, it's not, we, we work in a very practical way, very like, I'd call it quick and dirty, um, very, very cheaply. So uh, um, we might have to take you might call them shortcuts, it might be necessities, but um, so things like controlling for bias um, and things like that, you, you, you just can't do. I find the best thing, the, the best way to combat that personally is to know that we can't do that and tell people we can't do that um, when we share results. Um, getting as many um, point of views when interpreting results as possible um, also helps, but I think uh, personally that's that's why I'm here in a way, is to kind of find from you guys how we can make our methods more rigorous. For me, rigor goes, goes back to transparency because I'm not very keen on saying that, for example, user testing is not rigorous because it's able to do things that academia perhaps cannot do in terms of the distance to the users and the relevance, etc. But so, the way I've approached rigor in, for example, non-academia, um, it's been by being very clear on your intentionality, as Nicole was saying, uh, where are you positioned, and then collaboration. So talking to all the different stakeholders and actors involved in your research. So we work with production teams a lot, or these are similar to design teams a lot, and it's having this constant dialogue and um, being very clear in your research and your final report and how you communicate it on all this process. Um, and yeah, and then uh, for me, ethics and responsible research is very important. So yeah, I think that's part of the rigor. <laughs> I, I pretty much 100% agree with that answer, um, the intentionality and the collaboration. When I was saying engagement, collaboration is basically the same, the same thing. Um, I, uh, maybe this is a question for small groups, but I'm more, maybe more curious about why we care about rigor um, and, and maybe also the counterfactual, like what is, what is not rigorous, like being able to understand that. Um, but because I, I, I guess over the years I've felt like, um, I'm always striving to be more and more rigorous. And maybe at some point in the last few years, I was also, I, I hit a point where I realized um, I was questioning what, what the purpose of that was. You know, 
maybe I was d defining it incorrectly or I don't know. Um, but also just one comment on the design research side of things. Again, um, in recent years, I've realized that there's all sorts of methods, like say a creative session where you, it's all about crafting that one prompt, the how, white, how might we prompt. Um, it's the intentionality behind that one prompt and the intentionality around how you ask participants to come to that room, how you select them, how you even craft the invitation to them. So if, to me, that is rigorous. Um, at the same time, I'm used to writing, you know, 100-page research frameworks for design research that combines, uh, you know, that that is in the field. So, it's it's hard to answer that. <laughs> uh, no, we actually, I'm so sorry, but we have. Uh, I really want to get this into small groups because this is where you know we're intended to lay the table for you to have these conversations, and we're going to go out and join you at your tables as well. So. It will be like we are having one very large panel. Um, but the, the um, question that I want to kind of hold up, unfortunately without answering it up here, but was a very good one that I think has been prompted by the last three answers here is to focus on this question of design research um, and how does it relate to these kind of uh, uh, hierarchy endorsed uh, you know, constructs like academia, like, you know, this concept of achieving rigor, which is, you know, kind of a state of, of objective truth in some ways. Um, so how do we uh, connect our design research, which may not even define itself as research, with, you know, this other end of the spectrum, while uh, improving its legitimacy, if you will, uh, in the sense of identifying as research, uh, without impacting its relevance, its connection to you know utility, its responsiveness, and its affordability. Um, so you know that's maybe kind of a question that that we'll come back and answer again. But think about that because that is that is a really important question I think for us to process. But um, what we're going to do now is uh, you know ask you to answer these questions as well in your small groups. We're going to come out and sit with you. Um, so start off with you know. What kind of researcher are you? Um, what kinds of questions do you ask? What kinds of methods do you pursue? And then what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to start uh, thinking about participating in two um, projects that are linked to these uh, short links here. One of them is um, a principles page. So put in your thoughts on rigor, um, pro or con or, uh, or not. We also have their bias and ethics as two kind of prompts for thinking about contributing principles. The other is a spreadsheet. If you'd like to continue this conversation beyond the confines of this uh, limited workshop, would like to join a working group to talk about uh, civic tech research principles, identify ways that we can do more kind of cross-cutting research projects, uh, put your name on the spreadsheet so that we can kind of have a, an ongoing conversation after this. So uh, please uh, label yourselves. <laughs> okay, so everyone, I'm going to interrupt. I'm a, I'm a school teacher by trade, so you'll figure out. I'm going to interrupt your conversations, and I'm just going to keep talking until you all stop talking. This is a classic teacher technique, right? But I've been just kind of floating around. I'm Eric. I'm also on the GovX team, and I've just been listening into your conversations, you know, taking some quick notes, and kind of being the silent partner uh, until right now. And what I wanted to do is ask us all to reflect as a whole group in our last 10 minutes, just to think about the different themes we've talked about so we can take them down and continue the conversation as we go forward, as Emily noted at the beginning. So just a few things that I noted folks were talking about, about comparability, about we talked about mixed methods, what method is right at the right time, and how do you know? Uh, what method is right at the right time. We talked about represent, representation, who's an expert, and then I even heard some talk about pirating, and maybe we're all cool with pirating given our hats uh, today. Um, but, but what I'd like to ask each group to do is just quickly, you know, in one or two minutes, summarize and report out, and I will likely ask our panelists to do that, since it's what they signed up for, uh, to just quickly summarize some of the main themes so that I can write them down and we can continue the conversation going forward. So what I'm gonna do is actually start with Martin, over here, you drew the, the short straw today, Martin, uh, and then we're gonna go around in a circle and, and we'll wrap up in about five or 10 minutes, so. Thank you. I'm gonna stand, because otherwise I'll come back to you. Hello. 
your hats look amazing. I was worried we were going to look stupid. And look in. <laughs> so we talked about kind of um, establishing some baseline principles, and we aimed for just sort of one word per principle with the idea that we could take it forward in the working group and, and work on them more. Um, so the first word we've come up with as, as a principle, this doesn't mean, because it's first, it's the most important, it's just where we, where we started, is humility. Um, so uh, being, um, what's the, humil humilous? <laughs> so being humble in our, in our, in our research. <laughs> it's apparently not mine. Um, <laughs> Uh, the second one was transparency, so um, making methods and interpretations and, and everything as transparent as possible. Um, the third one was bias, and actually we spent an awful long time talking about this to the, to the point where I, I don't think we should, if we were to create a list of principles, that, that bias should just be one. There's, there's, there's so many kinds of bias. Um, uh, the word equity came up, and I think that was, that was, that was really important. Um, um, so the bias in power dynamics. Um, sort of self-checking your privilege, understanding your own sort of political stance and what your own goals may be, whether they're very like high up in your conscious or, or in your subconscious. Um, and interpretation, so um, uh, what, what did we settle on for that one? Um, I wanna save that for the last point because that was kind of the overall one, but um, uh, so, sorry. And the final one was replicability. Why I stumbled there was because um, uh, something I didn't know when we started this, or I sort of heard it, but I didn't realize how important it was, is that um, like rigor isn't something you can ever achieve. It's not something you get to and you're like, good job, you've got rigor, you're done. <laughs> or, and, and like unbiased research isn't something that exists. And I think that, that, that's like what I'm gonna take away from this session is that like, like striving for unbiased research is an idiotic thing to do. But just knowing that your bias exists and being able to account for it is, is all you can do. Um, so I'm quite confident that, that we take this forward in a working group and we, we talk about this however we decide to talk about it. Like we will get something approaching a list of principles that, that selfishly I can take away and, and make use of. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is challenging because we had a really uh, diverse group with a lot of different kinds of experiences, everything from uh, academics uh, steeped in theory to uh, people working in large organizations that do you know, structured multi-country uh, data collection to people considering A-B testing in their own organizations and people that are using partnerships with lots of different researchers on the ground in developing countries. Um, I think that if there were any throughputs in the conversation, we, we were just kind of getting there, but I think that one uh, was a question uh, about objectivity and bias when so much of our work is inherently normative, when we are trying to study political processes that necessarily induce bias, and when so many of the norms to which we adhere, you know, prioritizing uh, users, people on the ground, considering everyday people experiencing problems as experts, um, how that translates into biases that we might actually normatively want to pursue. And, and the way that bias can be uh, systematic or personal, and, and there's just a lot to navigate there, and especially with all the different perspectives we had in this group. So that was a conversation that we started that we'd like to continue. Um, I think another one was, uh, was, was general, uh, I don't know if I wanna say, uh, an emphasis on thinking about what the point of the research was, who was going to use it at the end of the day, what it was for, and how that should uh, and can uh, inform methodological choices and choices about how much rigor one needs and how much rigor one doesn't. We talked about that primarily, I think, in the, in the context of uh, credibility um, and, and making your research convincing, defending it from uh, criticism and attacks. Um, and we spent a lot less time talking about the importance of rigor in making sure that you answer the right question in the right way, that you get some kind of you know, truth with a capital T. That seems to be less important in the, the initial conversation we had here. So I think those were probably the two most interesting uh, outputs. Anything to add? Um, yeah, maybe just to add on the point about the, the rigor, depending on the, the audience and who's going to be using it. Um, we've found with some of the... I work at Transparency International, and sometimes we have a particular... 
um, idea in, about how the research will be used, but then once it's out in the public domain, other people will be using it in a completely different way. And, um, and then they criticise you for not doing things in a certain way, but that was never the intended consequence. So often it's always better to be more rigorous than less rigorous, because actually it might be um, used by a different group who was expecting it to be far more rigorous or far more academic uh, than it was ever intended to be. Oh, and one last quick thing. Uh, we also had a nice little uh, dispelling of the notion that academic research is necessarily more rigorous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad somebody would say that at the end. Thank you. Because I let the academic say that, not me. Uh, so, so um, please chip in if I'm not summarizing it properly. I think we needed just a couple more minutes to agree on the principles. But I think look, the majority on the table is working on either um, user research, applied research, action research, <laughs> however we want to label it. So we, in terms of methods, we talked a lot about um, being bottom-up um, and shaping theory rather than being theory-shaped. Um, we also talked about rigor as being subjective. Um, and this links to also a conversation we had on how to bring down the walls between academia, practitioners, and the different incentives in each of these sectors. So academia sometimes being incentivized by status and um, peer-reviewed journals, et cetera, rather than impacting quickly enough on the ground. And then organizations uh, being incentivized by um, donor structures sometimes and um, fear of critique, et cetera. Um, so we talked about communication, and someone used the word change of mindset in terms of being more ready to collaborate and with others and to find these spaces of engagement. Um, I think, yeah, we obviously also talked about transparency, the importance of being clear and honest about your intention, um, about power relations, ethics. We also talk about um, when organizations from the North and the South work together, often it's those from the North who get to publish or to get their names out there. So. That was an issue in terms of ethics and power. Um, I th have I forgotten something very obvious? Please feel free. I think that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for summarizing for me, because it's basically what we have discussed. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> And I think it's very interesting. Uh, we spent quite a lot of time on talking the how to communicate the result to practitioners. I think what you just said is exactly what we have been discussing. And I think that is pretty important that uh, practitioners know how to use the knowledge exactly for myself as well. I don't know what you have anything to add. It seems that they have summarized everything. Um, I think we uh, took up the, uh, I was personally very interested in finding out more about uh, efforts to link academic and design research so that we could explore what kinds of mechanisms are already out there. Um, and uh, John described, uh, you know, the practice of convening academics for a very large kind of project design process. So, you know, where that's possible, maybe as a collective, I thought that was really um, nice to bring up. Uh, the Matt's uh, kind of uh, self-identification as an applier, uh, not as somebody who, who, you know, kind of necessarily uses applied research, but translates research, um, you know, and the identification of that as really its own skill area and how do we hire those people, how do we ensure them, um, you know, a place in our process, um, I thought was really useful. Uh, there was a third point. Beck, did you also have a... Anyway, I put it actually in the... the what, what was it? Piracy, yes, yes, piracy is good, uh, was, was one of our principles. Um, but uh, <laughs> to, piracy is good? What is piracy? Oh, that's what it was, Chris. Get rid of paywalls was our principal rec one of our principal recommendations because you know, there's nothing that inhibits communication more than requiring people to pay $40 for a sliver that you don't even know if it's useful. So like, that, that was publicly funded. So that is bullshit. Um, but the, I'm sorry. Um, but the, the <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, to, to further this conversation, which is so interesting and uh, just getting started clearly, please take a picture of these links uh, and, uh, you know, please consider whether you'd be willing to keep this conversation going. We don't have a real formal 
a plan for how we will create uh, you know, a process going forward, but if we all get our name on a spreadsheet, if you're interested in continuing this conversation, uh, producing a product at the end, I'm very product driven myself. Um, so you know, like if you wanna participate in that, uh, please sign up. And if you have notes from this, please contribute them to this doc, the, the principles brainstorm list. I put in you know, a couple of bullet points, but please just add your own bullet points and headings. Um, and that will be a draft for what we can kind of move forward uh, and work on. And then just uh, on, on the issue of privacy, like I have a cushy PhD position right now, and one of the public services I try to provide is that if anybody ever needs access to an article, I'm a customer of on Twitter, I'll, I'll turn around within a day and get you whatever you need. Thank you.